the civilian employees of the U.S. Air Force. They're not in the military, yet they take the same oath. They don't wear the uniform, but they stand shoulder to shoulder with those who do. They're patriotic, hardworking Americans. They are the everyday heroes of Air Force civilian service. Forces joined. Well, hello and welcome to Air Force Civilian Services AIM Hire webinar. If you're just getting up to speed on what the Air Force Civilian Service is, our AIM Hire archives at afcivilliancareers.com backslash AIM Hire is a great resource. You'll find everything from the basics of working as a civilian in the Air Force and what that means for you to a number of episodes dedicated to specific career fields and what steps you can take to land a job in each. Plus, throughout the evening, I'll provide you with some helpful links and we'll, that will help decipher some of the acronyms we may use in our discussion. Be sure to save these resources for when you've logged off from tonight's episode. At ASCS, we're keenly aware of how every single project, no matter how small or large, is made possible by the contracting specialist. From determining which contractor to use for base equipment to which agency to award a contract for developing the next brand new aircraft, contracting specialists are there for it all. Tonight, we're joined by three professionals in the field who each bring their unique experiences as civilians in the Air Force to you this evening. We're also joined by AFCS recruiters who are monitoring questions submitted this evening through the Q&A will be on hand to answer your questions about everything from AFCS's unique culture, the hiring process, and everything you'll have look, to look forward to as a civilian employee of the world's most powerful Air Force. You've got questions, and believe me, we've got answers. Tonight, we'll be reading between the line items. I'm Bob Hall, a marketing, public relations, and brand management specialist with AFCS. I retired from the Air Force after about 28 years and now have about a little over four years with AFCS. But it's not about me, although I am excited to be your host today. So let's take a moment to meet each of our guests. First, we have Mike Carmody. If you've been following along for the latest episodes of AIM Hire, you'll recognize Mike from our webinar back in December where we talked about the intangible benefits of being a civilian with AFCS. If you're interested in watching that episode later on, we're posting the link in the chat so you can add it to your queue. Mike, for those in the audience who haven't met you yet, can you introduce yourself? Absolutely. <clears throat> so thanks, Bob, for having me back. Um, I, I began my career as a student career experience program uh, shortly after completing my degree from East Carolina University at Peterson Air Force Base, or now Peterson Space Force Base in Colorado Springs. Uh, what started as a summer internship uh, in 2007 has turned into nearly a 16-year career uh, in the Air Force as a uh, contract specialist, or 1102. Uh, during that time, I've touched a host of different programs from supporting NORAD U.S. Northern Command, uh, to supporting command and control intelligence surveillance reconnaissance platforms, to operational concerns, supporting construction projects, uh, to contingency contracting in a deployed environment. So had a host of different experiences that have led me to this point now where I am uh, the Deputy Division Chief of the Contracting Workforce Development Division uh, for SAF AQC. So again, I appreciate you, you putting out the acronym soup there to kind of help folks follow along. But anyway, I'm, I'm excited to be here and thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's always a pleasure, Mike, and welcome back to our webinar. Next, we have Lee Mulsler. Lee, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, uh, yeah, I, um, I came to work for uh, civil service after getting um, recruited out of college. I went to Southern Illinois University of Edwardsville, um, and in 2009, I graduated and started as a copper cap. Um, uh, working at Scott Air Force Base there, supporting Air Mobility Command. I didn't even know starting out what a GS employee or a copper cap intern or what any of those upward mobility programs were, but um, they were really great for me. Um, it helped me uh, very quickly kind of get to my GS-12 and have a very successful start to my career. 
Um, and then also, you know, help me springboard into getting my warrant, um, look sort of imagining what a long term career path with the government could be toward a pathway toward an SES. Um, and then if that's if that's what each person wants to go toward um, and eventually working toward my unlimited warrant and, um, uh, you know, some several geographical moves sort of like from Scott to New Mexico and then now to DC area um, and I'm a procurement analyst working at the Pentagon. Um, working and supporting the installations um, support division. Outstanding. Thanks, Lee. And waiting in the wings, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Doug Golden. Thanks, Bob. And um, so my name is Doug Golden. I'm also on the uh, staff at the at the Pentagon working for headquarters Air Force um, in the contracting division. Um, I began my enlisted career, much like Bob, in the mid-1980s. Um, I began my contracting career in 1993 at Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane, Washington. And I retired from the Air Force in 2003, where, where I really began my civil service career and um, began to, to kind of work my way through the civilian side of what we do. Um, in my time as a, a, in contracting, I've done the operational side, I've, like Micah said. Um, I have several deployments and time in the Middle East working um, deployed environment, de de deployed procurement. Um, and uh, I've worked overseas in Germany as a, as a um, staff member for headquarters there. Um, I helped stand up United States Space Force. I saw there was one question about um, a couple of the Sentinel bases. So, um, but I'm currently a procurement analyst on uh, working for the Secretary of the Air Force and I've uh, been there for two years and I kind of love what I do. So thank you, Bob. Uh, no, thank you. And thank you all so much. Thanks to everyone in our audience for joining us this evening. Honestly, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, but before we get into the interview portion, if you will, before we get rolling with that, let's start off with a poll. Well, let's learn a little bit about our audience. Of the choices listed, what do you see as being the greatest employment benefit? So you can choose opportunities for professional development, Retirement benefits, clear mission, or job security. It's interesting that uh, you know those things should go. And you know, we're going to wait just a moment, give everybody an opportunity to answer that. Um, because I'll tell you, you know, when you're looking at some of these things, I got a lot to say, but I'll wait for I'll wait for the poll results. <laughs> All right, outstanding. Opportunities for professional development. Well, I can tell the audience that you've already heard, you've got a kind of a taste for some of the development of our panelists, and we're going to get a little bit deeper into that. So no doubt that if you're looking for promotion opportunities, professional development, um, you're, you've come to the right place. So like I said, we're going we're to have a lot of fun tonight. But Lee, I'm going to begin with you for just a second. Um, during your introduction, you spoke about the Copper Cap program. For any audience members who might be current students or recent graduates, um, can you explain what the Copper Cap program is and what you've enjoyed about it? Yeah, that's a great question because it's an awesome program and a lot of people come in through that uh, force renewal program. And Mike mentioned, will mention that hopefully a little bit later um, from his background. but. Um, for recent graduates um, with, and there, there's an emphasis on academic um, excellence. So, you know, GPAs are usually on the higher end toward the 3.0. Um, for people who are, who, you know, have graduated and want to get in with an upward mobility program and move quickly, hopefully from a seven or nine to a 12. Um, and uh, the really great thing I think about that program is, you know, like when I started working, I had friends that were graduating and going to work for like enterprise and different companies as interns. Um, and they're washing cars, you know, or doing some or fetching coffee and you don't want to be a glorified minion, right? You want to have um, impact in your job. So one of the great things about that program was it gave me the opportunity to do that. The opportunity at a very early stage to have hands on opportunities to take a lot of responsibility, really make an impact. And then um, because you have to get a lot of continuous learning points and get your certifications early on, you kind of grow yourself into a community of your peers. That's outstanding. That's, that's some really great information, Lee, and I appreciate that. So if you're interested in learning more about our Copper Cap program, you can visit afintern.com. I'll, I'll shamelessly plug several of our websites. 
throughout the evening. But that's my first, AFintern.com. Um, Mike, I'm going to kick it over to you because you also started your career with AFCS in the Copper Cap program. Can you share about your experience and what you liked about it? Sure, absolutely. So <clears throat> I, I thought, you know, to Lee's point, uh, it's a very rewarding program. So when I started as a Copper Cap, I initially started in our services division. So basically what that means is um, all the um, support that we receive in the Air Force that requires basically a body of knowledge or, or an expert to come in and to address a problem, um, we usually contract that service out if we do not have it in-house. So I began that, as I mentioned previously at Peterson, uh, but then uh, roughly about a year, two years into the program, uh, I met my spouse who is a active duty member in the Air Force uh, and she got an assignment to Georgia. And so I wasn't sure what to do and what flexibilities there were, um, but not to worry. Um, I had a, an excellent mentor at the time, uh, Doug Golden, uh, who's here, uh, uh, kind of helped help me understand what opportunities were out there, especially in Georgia. And reaching back to the career field team at AFPC, which if folks don't understand, um, even though you're assigned to a base, in which the website has a ton of this information, but even though you're assigned to a base or one location, um, there is a, a central organization of roughly 12 folks, a team of 12 folks that are there to support you. So any questions that you may have, questions, concerns, development, they can address that. So when I reached out to them, they said, hey, no problem. What we'll do is we'll just transfer you you're in, with your internship from one location to another location in Georgia to allow you to keep your family together while your wife has her assignment there. And when she gets another assignment, we'll work another action to help you outplace and move to the next organization. So for me, from that perspective, it, it was it, it kind of set the tone that the Air Force is heavily invested in the family. And, and that is one thing that has always stuck with me and that I try to remind folks, especially when I'm, in, when I'm mentoring someone, is that there's a lot of opportunities in the Air Force. You just got to make sure that you're that you're that you're looking into them and you're making those connections with folks who can help you see that path or a few few miles down the road. No, that's, that's outstanding, Mike, and, and, and you're absolutely right. It's wonderful to know that you've got a support team, no matter where you are, to ensure that you're reaching those goals that you're looking for. You know, Lee talked about moving up, and you're talking about, you know, the opportunities to move around and to move up and that kind of thing. Um, and in your introductions, each of you kind of spoke about different hats that you've worn in your careers as contract specialists. Um, and I want to help the audience understand how movement around different positions works with the Air Force Civilian Service. And Doug, I'm going to start with you. Thanks, Bob. So um, as I mentioned in my introduction, um, I, I, I enlisted in 1983 out of Baltimore, Maryland. I'm 17 year old kid, not really a whole lot of direction. I, I took a different path on my on my career, certainly my academic career. Um, took a little bit longer than, than these two young gentlemen to my sides. But um, <laughs> I, after 10 years um, in the Air Force, I, I got the opportunity to what we call retrain into the contracting career field. And frankly, um, at Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane, Washington, I didn't know what contracting meant. Um, we thought we'd be digging ditches or, or buying construction or something. And what it turned out to be was we, as Mike said, we buy anything for the base, for the garrison, for the installation that... Um, that we cannot achieve through organic resources or those wearing a uniform. Um, and, and coming from a, a job where I was working, um, you know, 12 hour shifts, had to pull a gun before I came on board, had to turn it out at the end of the day and transitioning into a, um, a position where as a contract specialist, I dealt primarily with the public and how we spend our money and how we write contracts. Um, it actually, it, it requires you to think a lot more. It requires you to see down the road of, of what's required for the for um, for your mission partners. Um, and that was a little bit of a change for a guy who was used to telling people what to do for 10 years. Um, and then I had to go from that to asking people what they needed. And it's a little bit of a change, but it's one that um, in 1993, I enjoyed. And it's uh, it's been almost 29 years since. And, and I can still say to this day, I still enjoy what we do. Um, I worked my way through the, through contract specialist in, in the lit, various leadership roles, um, at Fairchild Air Force Base, as, as, as I said before, I spent some time in the Middle East in uniform. Um, I got to go back to Peterson Air Force Base, um, as a civilian and really get to see what the Air Force Space Command mission was. And some of y'all would know now we call it, um, United States Space Force. And I got to see some of that mission stand out, which I'll talk about later on. 
Um, and currently, I, as I mentioned, I'm a career broadener at, at the headquarters level. Um, something I never thought I'd do for for an old broke down guy from Baltimore. Um, but I love what I love what I do every day. Um, currently, I'm the executive officer for our for our senior um, civilian. And um, day by day, I get to see so much more than I ever expected in contracting. And um, and I think that's because back back in the mid '90s when they said, "What do you want to do?" I said, "I want to do something that I'm allowed to think and allowed to to, to kind of broaden up a little bit." So. Here we are, and I, and I and I really look forward to to seeing where the next part of my career goes. I got to tell you, Doug, listening to this and you know looking at the title of tonight's episode, reading between the line items, I think you've kind of nailed that right there. There's more than just this or this or this, and looking at the papers and looking at contracts or whatever. You know, when you see the the broad scope of the results of what you guys do, it's phenomenal. And that's got to give you a good feeling. I know, you know, I'm excited about the job that I have, but I always get excited hearing your stories. And, you know, you could say I have a passion for that. And, and so, you know, speaking of passion, Lee, you seem to have a passion for professional development. You know, you, you talked about it a little bit, um, but I'm going to I'm going to drag a little more out of you. OK, so what formal and informal avenues have you learned about that have helped you advance in your career and your plan for the future? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And um, I think the cool thing about it is seeing that so many people like, you know, in the poll were interested in that because it's one thing that um, hugely you're given in civil service, but especially in the contracting career field, um, it's highly encouraged. Right. And so there's a lot of um, on the job training you can do. When I first started as a copper cap, we all were all given our like three inch ring binder with uh, pages and pages of our career field training plan and different things that we're gonna to get to do informally with our trainers, working with our one-on-one -on -one flight chiefs or, or our section chiefs. Um, and that was really cool because you had that more senior person kind of, it was almost more of a collegial friendship, right? They took you under their wing and gave you that training. And then as you kind of go through the ranks, you get into more formalized training um, of the civilian development education that is available. Um, learning about executive core qualifications and things that are pathways to a more senior executive career um, and the professional military education that you get that teaches you how to speak, you know, the military uh, vernacular. Um, right. And, and another example is for a lot of people right now, like um, executive leadership and coaching is a big thing. And that's something that I got exposed to in the Air Force um, early on. It was a training when I reached my GS-13 level. They, they, um, when I was working for AFSOC in New Mexico, um, they had all of us who are 13s um, take uh, leadership coaching training, and um, that really promoted, pro propelled me to want to become a coach. So that pushed me into wanting to do my own um, coaching credentialing. And um, it also, there's the aspect of mentorship, right? Like um, you, you have formal and informal mentors assigned. And one of the things you know, that you can have is you know, you can enroll one of your, you know, your immediate bosses as a as a mentor, but you also have um, tools in the Air Force um, through things like my vector that help you. You can go out and formally find a mentor, have someone formally appointed where you go through a formal process of doing that regular check ins. Um, those are things and, and that's highly rewarded and encouraged. And that sort of thing, I don't know if it's it's um, as as popular, um, you know, in the private sector. And, and that was a great point right there, Lee. What's available in the private sector? Um, I mean, I spent very little time, honestly, I spent very little time in the private sector between the time I took off the uniform and the time I came over here to Air Force Civilian Service. Um, but it seemed like, you know, the people that I was working with were looking to on how they were going to move up themselves as opposed to how can I help Bob or how can I help someone else move up? And so the mentorship that we find within the Air Force, I think is just outstanding. I mean, the training opportunities, career development programs, you know, they're just some of the many perks of our job, you know, and so, you know, I could, again, I could talk for, for hours about that, but we're going to talk about some other benefits that you do experience um, that you wouldn't if you were working in, in the private sector. Um, Mike, I want to start with you. Sure, sure. Um, so just in terms of some of the benefits of, of compared to the public sector versus uh, private or working for government, you know, one thing too, I just wanted to also key in on that, that Lee hit on is with professional development. You know, there's a saying of you can only support what you understand. 
And the Air Force is a huge advocate of closing a lot of those knowledge gaps and experience gaps by having different opportunities, different programs that you can roll into from short term to long term, uh, to including master's degrees um, that help you get a broader sense of, of, of the Air Force mission, uh, but also just give you so much exposure to different things. Now, one of the things I would say from a from a benefit standpoint, I know as part of the poll that that was some of the responses um, is, you know, from a financial perspective, as we talked about, you know, that that seven, nine, 11, 12 outplacement piece is huge, right? Especially if you're coming out of school, maybe you have student loans, maybe you have, some, you know, some of that's consideration. One of the benefits of the copper cap program is they have what's called student loan repayment program, uh, which which basically covers or, or pays back up to $30,000 of, of federal student loans, which is a huge benefit. Uh, there's also recruitment or, or relocation incentives offered. So kind of when you blend those together, it gives you a different, it kind of gives you a full site picture of how they value the member. But the other piece I'd say is looking at total compensation. A lot of times, you know, when I used to go out on the road and do recruiting, uh, you know, for the copper cap program, you know, the first question I get asked is, well, I'm getting an offer from industry and they're offering me X amount more. Right. And you're, 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 the gap is, it looks to be fairly, fairly big. And I'd say, well, look, you got to look at it from a total compensation standpoint. And in fact, OPM has a great site. If you go out to it where they kind of list out all the benefits from your annual leave, your sick leave uh, to your salary and factor all that in there so that you can see these are the benefits paid by paid to you by on the behalf of the government. And so when you start wanting to compare that apples to oranges, then you can really line up and figure out, okay, this is actually what my compensation package is. But oh, and by the way, uh, you know, the leave benefits are very generous. So I'll, I'll kind of hold on, hold off on that or kind of exit stage, but getting to spend a lot of time with families is, is hugely important. And I know as, as you go on having different endeavors and stuff, that leave is, is critical. Oh, yeah, no kidding. I mean, work-life balance is just one of those huge benefits that, again, you can't see in your paycheck, but your whole life you feel it, you know. <laughs> and, and so I think that, you know, when you talked about the difference between your paycheck and really what you're getting, um, that work-life balance to me just really, really stands out. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I found that leadership managers really do embrace that part of our culture. Um, Doug, what about you? What do you enjoy, you know, as a civil service employee? Well, uh, um, Mike alluded to earlier, him and I have got some time together at Peterson Air Force Base. And and I think that the thing that I remember about Mike when, when he was younger and I was little, little as gray was um, he, he came with a desire not just to, to, to develop and to be promoted, but to work um, and to understand what, who he was supporting. Um, he talked about beating Caroline and, and, and having to, to move along with her a little bit. And, and that does bring a little bit of stress, but Mike was always, what do you think is best? What can I do next? Um, so the thing I like about this career field, specifically this career field, um, that I've seen is they work hard. Those 12 people in San Antonio work hard to make sure that your needs are met as much as possible. Now we all understand sometimes the mission is going to take priority, but, Sure. I have seen them, um, 180, 200 people, Mike, in a, in a developmental role, yeah. line by line, talk about the people in, in each location, what their situation is, where do they want to be. And that's not something everybody gets to do. So, so from that aspect, from the day that I, that I became a contract specialist in 1993, and, and my boss had to call down to Texas as a military guy to get me um, into, the, into the job site. Um, that has always uh, kind of rang true for me that we we are here to take care of our people. Now, uh, as Mike said, um, we are not a, a, a for for profit business. We are a military. We we are there to support the literally support the war fighter who is currently doing their thing. And um, but but we it's a service mission. We are service oriented. It's it's civil service is what we do. So sure. that's something that would be expected of you. But I find that the successful contracting people, the leaders that we have now, all they do is serve others um, and, and lead others. So uh, Lee has mentioned the, the training opportunities, and um, I'll, I'll go on record now to say we are career development. We are not job development. If you want a job, there's plenty of a by the hour job that you can go after um, that, that don't entail the Air Force or, or contracting. But if you want a career where, as, as Mike has said, 
it's going to take you three years to get you to the basics of where we want you to be. And we invest heavily to get you there. Um, we do invest literally in your in paying off some of your student debt. We invest in the schools you'll go to. You will learn how to be a leader. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. So there's plenty of those opportunities out there. Um, and that's worldwide. I know people that have served in Korea. I know some people that have served in Hong Kong, Europe, Middle East. Um, so we're everywhere. Um, we're kind of like roaches. Uh, you, you don't hear about us a whole lot, but we're, but we're there. We're there, to, we're, we're there to help you out as we move along. The other thing I'd say that I enjoy um, is things like this, where you get to reach out a little bit and, and, and work with other people. Um, I talked to a lady today that I've been mentoring for about four years, um, who's getting ready to move on from the Copper Cap program. And, um, and, and a little plug here, she's now working as a mentor to my daughter who was trying to get into the Copper Cap program. And I don't say that lightly. Um, that's just kind of paying forward what she does um, to help others. And I, and that's truly appreciated from a, from a guy who has two daughters that, that need to be taken care of by others who will mentor. So, um, so that, thank you, Bob, for that question. No, that's, and that's outstanding, Doug. And, and you know, I, I really appreciate all that you shared because you talked about, you know, folks taking care of you when they had to call down to Texas and paying that forward, um, you know, with, with your daughters and, and all kinds of things and, and the development programs. Um, I want to I jump out for just one second because we had a question from the audience um, that, you know, I mean, that's what we're here for, right? We're here to answer the questions from the audience. Yep. And you know, we've talked a lot about the Copper Cap program, and of course, that is following, you know, your completion of your bachelor's degree. Um, you could, you know, anyway, um, but the question is, and this came from an anonymous, so I can't say, you know, so-and-so, unfortunately, um, but they're listening, I'm sure. Um, the question is, do you need to have a college degree to work as a civilian, and do I need to be active duty? Now, the first thing is I'm going to I'm going to take that active duty question because we get that a lot. Um, no, you do not have to. Have, there's no military obligation whatsoever. There's no military re prerequisite. You didn't have to wear a uniform to be part of the Air Force Van Service. I know Lee never wore the uniform. Mike never wore the uniform. And yet here they are, you know, now at the, you know, working, you know, top level. So they've, they've moved up without that basic experience. But I want to I want somebody here to address the the college degree question um, because you guys have a lot of experience and you've dealt with a lot of people and like I said for my introduction it's not about me so who would like to field that question? Um, Mark, you know, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll jump in there real <laughs> quick um, and then I'll turn it over. No, uh, so the short answer is yes, but but the good news is right there's a silver line to that. Uh, previously, they require, you know, is, is whatever degree or background, but 24 hours in business. Uh, within the last two years, they've eliminated the 24 hours in business piece because we like to take the approach of recruit for attitude, train for skill. Right. And if you're if we have any uh, Marine Corps members or devil dogs on the line, that's a that's a mantra they're probably familiar with. And basically what that means is if, if you're willing to put in the effort, just like what Doug talked about previously, you can pick this up and learn along the way. I found that when I initially got into the career field, I was overwhelmed by, by a lot of the lexicon, right? The terminology that was being used. And I felt it was such a foreign concept to me. But as I went through it and day to day realized, you know, hey, I go out and I find the best price for this or when I'm negotiating to buy a car or going to the grocery store, right? Or balancing a checkbook or, you know, you're looking at your account, your savings account, your retirement, whatever it is, right? You're doing all those things that business acumen that is directly applicable and translatable into our career field. So- I would say that no, that there's no specific degree. There is a degree requirement. Now, if you have a, a bachelor's degree, right, that, that will allow you to come in or start as a GS7. Uh, if you have a master's degree, that allows you to come in as a GS9. Both of them have a target 12 or they, they outplace as a GS12. But that's, that's a little bit of the difference between them. So I will say that there's different, you know, certainly it, it may help you if you had an economics or business or background, but myself, sure. I was political science and criminal justice. So if I can make it, you know, a lot of folks can't. <laughs> that, that's just yeah. kind of a few thoughts on that. So I'll, I don't know if Lee no, and that's And that's great. And, you know, um, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of take a step 
aside from, from your business, so to speak, just to say for Air Force civilian service, not all of our programs require a degree, but if you're here and you're interested in contracting, absolutely, you, got, you have to have it. And like Mike said, um, you don't necessarily have to major in finance or major in something, you know, bring your attitude, show us your transferable skills, and we're going to do all that we can to place you in a position that you're looking for. Um, and, you know, what we've been talking about, you know, as far as those benefits that we've talked about and, you know, getting your degree and things like that, which, of course, you know, a lot of people aspire to even, you know, kind of like Doug and myself, I came in right out of high school, basically myself, you know, so I didn't have my degree when I joined the Air Force and the Air Force paid for my degree and two master's degrees and that kind of thing. Um, so we're going to get you where you want to be. But all of that support really does build the morale of our employees. And that's something that I stand proud on, you know, each and every day. Um, but Lee, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of kind of circle it back, if you will. Um, can you tell us about the perks you enjoy as a civil service employee? Because I didn't mean to leave you out. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah, no, uh, great question. And kind of going back to um, something that Mike and Doug both pointed to earlier, um, the, with the total compensation and thinking about things, because whenever I would hire new people, that was a conversation we would have, right? Um, there's so many intangible benefits about being a civil servant that um, people don't think about. And I, I would even, this might seem like less of a tan, like a benefit, but like just the fact that you're, for starters, you're working for an organization, you take an oath of office to be a part of this community, right? Um, you're defending the constitution. Other people aren't saying they're doing that when you come to work every day. You're part of something bigger. You're working for a cause that's powerful. You're supporting one of the greatest countries in the world, the greatest country in the world, right? Sure. You're, um, you have a paid wellness time when you can go to the gym. Um, you have the work-life balance that you don't find in other jobs. Um, you have people willing to share their knowledge and experience um, with you to intentionally grow you because they get benefits out of making you a better leader. Um, and then moving into the tangibles, um, things like an, ex an extremely good um, a defined contribution plan, like our 401k, which is the thrift savings plan, uh, great leave and, and uh, paid wellness time and things time off, one of the best programs in the industry. Um, just just to name some of the some of the top ones. No, and that's and see, I think that that's that's so important for people to understand, um, because as long as I've been doing this and as many in person events I've been to and stuff like that, people seem to think that we're just you know I, I hate to use the uh, catchphrase or whatever, but that we're just kind of tin soldiers and we just march to whatever orders were given. Um, but what you guys are expressing tonight, all the benefits that really recognize you as individuals, you know, as real people with real lives and real goals, you know, I, that just speaks volumes for me. OK. And then, of course, you know, let's be honest, there's very there's a very small percentage of people in the United States that are wearing a uniform. And, and so. You know, when you get to work side by side with them and see, you know, that that mission and what they're doing and your effect on that, I think that that's a big thing, too. Um, and so, Doug, I'm going to talk to you for just a second because you're a veteran yourself. You know, so can you tell us a little bit about what it's like now working on the other side of the uniform? Sure, Bob. So um, the first thing I'll say, I'll, I'll say is I'll go back to when I retired in, in um, June of 2003. And um, I think the, the the biggest difference that I can see, other than my my uniform won't fit me anymore, for it's just seems to shrink, it seems to shrink hanging in the closet. But um, is growing up um, in contracting and growing through the process and and kind of taking on varying roles within the contracting world. Um, I got to I get to see what we are doing, not just um, day to day buying stuff because our boss told us to, but who we are supporting and how we are impacting um, the mission downrange. Um, I, I mentioned at one time that we have, uh, I've, I've, I've spoken to, to, to special operators, I've talked to space operators, um, and, and to know that our, our work as civilians supports them so that they can go downrange, because one of the things that, that not many people know is that the 
the almost 1,000 enlisted folks that are doing contracting, and Mike, I think it might be a little bit less these days, maybe about 800 or so, their sole purpose in the Air Force is not to come to work on, on, a, on an Air Force base and kind of hang around for the day. Their sole purpose is to be ready to go downrange Iraq, Omar, or Iraq or Afghanistan or, or wherever the next uh, conflict is and support those warfighters on the ground. And, I, and I've done that, Mike, Mike indicated he's done that as well. So the biggest thing that I can say is um, when I got over to the civilian side, I didn't really care so much anymore about what I had to do for them in the military, uh, the, the, the fitness, the training and all that stuff. What I started caring about then was how can I, um, you know, from seven to five every day, reach out and, and support my, my partners um, in NORAD, or NORTHCOM and, and, and Air Force Base back then. And, and what they needed to do. So, um, and, and to understand that impact, you might not see it every single day, but in the end of the day, when you look back on what you've done and what you've purchased and what you've gone through the acquisition process for, you really get to see how we are, we are really making um, this Air Force stronger to, to compete with our, with our big um, partners uh, globally. Uh, and that's great. And, you know, again, Doug, I just, you know, Shameless plug for those of us that have worn the uniform. I do want to thank you for your service. Um, and, and Mike, I, I'm going <laughs> to, I got to turn this over to you for just a second because, you know, I spent many years in uniform and my wife, my spouse, you know, had probably the hardest job in the Air Force. That's what they say. The military spouse has the hardest job, you know, and you're, you're the military spouse. Okay. So what's it like for you to support the Air Force mission? Um, so I, I think, you know, I'm not unique in this, but uh, it's certainly very personal to me um, to think that I have an opportunity to solve a problem that either maybe my, my wife or, or her friends or other friends that we have that wear the uniform, that I can directly contribute to a solution that then helps them go down, get their mission done, and then come home safely at night. You know, that's one of the big things is that you know, as a military spouse, my, my greatest concern always is, you know, what's going to happen when, when my, you know, when my wife or when anybody's significant other, when they go in harm's way, are they going to come back home? You know, we have four kids and I'm, you know, other families have kids and you start trying to, to figure out how can you help them out? But one of the things that we did, we took it upon ourselves in our career field in contracting to stand up what's called a military spouse group. Right. Not just to find professional opportunities for military spouses that are having to leave one base and go to another, but to also be a resource for them to talk about, hey, when you transition into a new area, this is how you figure out, you know, what school system you're going to go into. Are there other folks that are in that area? You know, is there, you know, what grocery stores are there? You know, what are their hours of operation in this area? I mean, all the little things that you don't always think about. When you move into an area, that's another way that we provide that support. And I just think it kind of speaks to that, that broader, big Air Force family. Uh, and for me, that's one thing that has kept me here uh, for the past, like I said, going on 16 years is that, that, that feeling of not just re you know, rewarding service, but also that it, it's just like a family and that you got folks that, that are looking after you. Yeah, no, and it, and that's that's great, Mike. And, and absolutely, you know, like you say, it's it's personal because it is. You know, I mean, again, you know, you get to see uh, peace of mind, if you will, when when your wife comes home, and you know, you're you're able to talk a little bit about how the jobs intertwine, even though they're so different. You know, and, and so that's that's a big big thing. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to an audience question um, because we obviously we're talking Air Force, right? Um, but, you know, people bring experience from all over the place, you know, and, and so I've got a question from Gideon. He says, I'm currently a finance technician in the Army. Are there trainings or certifications I can take to prepare for a contracting specialist role? So he's working in finance, but he'd like to know, is there certifications or training he can take? to move over to contracting and so, hopefully okay. as part of it, the air force family at least jump it up there you yes. go yeah so, so that's so that, so just to, i'll use a corollary because um when i was at cannon air force base we were pretty remote right so i looked for i mean 
I, I won't say I broke any rules, but I, I bent the heck out of them, right? To find out how, how any possible way I could recruit somebody into contracting. And, sure. the, and so the best example I could give you, which is sort of a tangentially related is like a paralegal. I had folks, uh, I hired a paralegal there um, that didn't have any contracting background experience, but she had uh, her bachelor's degree and um, she would agreed that she could come in as a seven and we looked for ways we could bring her in as a nine and that wasn't she didn't have enough we couldn't argue that it was contracting you know automatically right. so um you don't have to have the contracting met already if you if you're in a related career field that just makes it easier for you to make a soft landing into that job that's great when you are looking into you know coming into the contracting career field the biggest thing you can do is show how you is look for your business acumen even though we don't need 24 credit hours anymore that's a, still a, a highly desirable characteristic sure. it's going to make it easier for you to move in than a degree in underwater basket weaving obviously so 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 that's what i would say is to this guy as a finance technician um you probably have a lot of knowledge with funds and, and money that you can easily apply and if you can get yourself um when you work on your resume, I want to show how it's connected to things in the business acumen or things that would touch contracting. And then when you when you talk to somebody who can help you get your foot in the door, make it clear how you could be good for that job, how you could be an easy shoe in for that. Yeah, no, that, and that's great advice, Lee, and, and I appreciate you sharing that because, you know, we talk about that a lot, those transferable skills, you know, um, for those that have worn a uniform, um, we, we've performed a lot of additional duties and we don't always see how that transfers over. Um, and Gideon's working specifically in finance, so he's used to crunching the numbers and things like that. Um, there's, there's probably a lot more in his field than, he, than he's really taking credit for right now um, to move over. But I'm glad to see he's got that, you know, that goal uh, to join our team, but uh, to join your team as well. Hey, Bob. And one more thing, Bob, I don't mean to cut you off, but there, this too, just, just for him to keep this in mind too, because it's really important to me that people know how they can kind of like make it. Don't forget that, you know, you might be hitting the upper cap of maybe you're a seven or a nine or something like that, and you can't go any higher. But if you can get your foot in the door and take an initial seven and a target 12 in three years, that's that's that intangible again, right up front that you have that upward mobility you don't have, that you hit a ceiling on the other job path. Right. And hey, no, hey Bob, if I could just yeah, say Mike. just two things, uh, because you're an active duty member already, you, you should be able to, to go to Defense Acquisition University and okay. take some of those continuous learning credits. Uh, to be able to get some of that exposure into contracting as well as the the only professional this is not an endorsement of them but uh, national contract management <laughs> association or ncma uh, also has a lot of uh, foundational certificates that you can go and explore um, but at least to get some of that exposure so you can get more insight uh into our career field and i think doug were you, would you yeah the only thing that i would say is um <laughs> and mike you've already talked about it um, and I don't want to overstate the obvious, but you, the first thing you need to get is a little eight and a half by 11 piece of paper that says you have an undergraduate. And I think right. until you put, until you walk out with that, um, that is really, for lack of a better term, it's your ticket to the dance. And, um, right. and if you don't have that, all the certificates in the world, you, you, legally, we cannot hire you. Um, so I would say get that first. Uh, I would say go to DAU. That was going to be my answer. So thanks, Mike. Um, and then find your relevant skills in the world that you're working and, um, and see how they apply to our knowledge, skills, and abilities that we need to have within our contracting career field. No, and that's all that's all great, great stuff, guys. And, and and honestly, that's why we host these webinars every month is so that the audience can hear, you know, good advice that they can apply, you know, to themselves right now, you know, or if, if you're transitioning or, you know, whatever. Um, you're getting a real good foundation of information from our panels here. Um, and, and so I think it's just invaluable what you guys are sharing. I really do. Um, and I, I do want to get, you know, kind of bring it back just a little bit. Um, cause for me, I like to talk about myself, um, uh, but I'm not going to, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to give you guys a chance to talk a little bit about yourselves in the idea, uh, here, the question I want to ask is, can you describe a time where you really felt especially connected to the bigger picture? 
Mike, I'm going to start with you. Um, sure, absolutely. Uh, so I had an opportunity as a civilian um, to deploy uh, to Afghanistan. Uh, it was, uh, you know, something I wasn't sure of stepping into, but I knew that uh, I wanted to to serve to the maximum extent possible. Right? You know, I've I've never wore the uniform, uh, but I've always wanted to be there to support. So having that opportunity to go down there and getting to see uh, the mission that's prosecuted, as, as Doug mentioned, that that downrange capability. But also seeing firsthand um, just what it takes, right, to go out to, you know, we think about, we talk about the warfighter, how much that is invested into it from a capability standpoint, right, from logistics flying in to the battlefield to, to resupply, to fuels, to network, right, to the internet, all these different things that tie into it, but also having an opportunity uh, to volunteer uh, to support what was called a, a mass cal team or basically a medical support team to go out and help Afghan wounded coming back uh, from the battlefield and to help them transition from there to the military hospital on the other side of our compound. And getting to see that firsthand gave me that appreciation that when we think about freedom, we talk about the sacrifices that are made. You know, the men and women in our country that are making those sacrifices, they're doing this not 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 for themselves, but for everybody else. And so the pride that I felt coming away from that and and, and getting a better understanding of that is something that I, that that I will carry with me for the rest of my life and will tell the story as much as I can, just because I, I want folks to know that that you can and you will have an impact. Yeah, no, absolutely. And thank you for sharing that. And I, and I remember your story about when you were deployed, you know, and you volunteered for that. And, and that's a big thing, too, is just the idea that, you know, you do recognize the big picture and you, and you want to get out and you want to put your hands on it, so to speak. Um, Doug, I know that you've got a great story to, to share um, about, you know, seeing that bigger picture, making things happen. So why don't you tell your story? Sure. Um, thanks, Bob. Uh, so uh, while I was at Peterson Air Force Base and in the in the spring summer of um, 2019, um, if you missed it in the news, uh, you can relook it up. But um, Air Force Space Command became its own military agency in that it became the United States Space Force. Um, I happened to work on the headquarters staff at the time. And the commander of Air Force Space Command, General John Raymond, um, became the the commander, the first commander of the you know, United States Space Force. Um, in the building that we worked, there was a thing we called the um, the operations center, and that was kind of like General Raymond's floor. That's where he got all the site picture around the world, how his satellites were working, um, how his networks were working, and all these good things. And it was generally a U.S. driven function. There was a couple other um, nations that were involved, but for the most part, it was a U.S. Air Force only function. Um, so when General Raymond took that flag in the spring of 2019, his direction to us in the contracting world was he went to an operations center that was a joint operations center within 180 days of him taking that flag. Um, and if you've ever done any kind of construction project, and these days, if you've ever tried to build a home, you're not getting anything done 180 days. You might get your cabinets ordered in 180 days. Um, so his direction was well, he wanted his um, his jock, his joint operations center, stood up um, 180 days from when he took the flag. So doing quick math, that was like the beginning of the fall of 2019. So myself and my boss um, and a couple of other hard chargers, we sat down with the with the people who needed the center. We straw manned out literally on several pieces of paper with some rulers and pencils, and we figured out what the operations center needed to do, who it needed to support, what nations were allowed in, which and, and how we got, could, could support them as well, and still keep the security of the United States secrets um, secure while they were in that building. So we figured out a way to make that happen. Um, we went to three separate contractors. We got a competitive proposal from each one that probably took them five days to do. Um, and within 180 days, except for some equipment that we just could not get, uh, General Raymond was in seat um, working from his joint operations center. Um, I, I think that's as in my almost 40 years in, around the Air Force, that's probably one of my, my proudest moments, not because of me, but because um, no one, when you walked in there, there was like 40 people on this project and no one cared where you came from. We, we worked across the walls. In fact, there, there wasn't no walls. We all worked at the same table. 
We tore down all the barriers and we just communicated. We brought three major contractors in there. We're talking top 10 defense contractors. And we said, this is what we need. We don't need you all to argue with us about it. And we need the best proposal you can give us. And we got that. And, I'll, and I'm also proud to say, and, and if you've ever heard about the $400 toilet seat, um, we got it at a pretty decent price considering everything we had to do in, 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 in around six months. So um, still one of my happiest achievements and something I'll probably talk about until uh, I'm a little grayer than I am now. Thanks, Bob. Well, and you know, and it's funny, Doug, because now I get to say, I know the guy that helped make this happen, <laughs> you know, so I, I could ride your, your coattails right there. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that is, that's obviously big mission, big picture stuff, you know, um, Lee, I know that you've had some experiences and, and you know, we all do. Um, why don't you share with us, you know, your experience with, with that bigger picture, you know, being connected there. Yeah, so I think there's a couple really good ones um, that are the most, and I think it's like sort of because I've I've got 13 going on 14 years, and it's sort of like beginning, middle, and um, sort of current in my career. One of those was when I first started as a copper cap, um, getting to share a community of people that was all going through the same thing as me. Um, you could see how you're like that next crop. You know, I'm a millennial, right? So we're always looking for like people like us in the workforce. So um to share that experience with right so i had a whole group of people that i could have in my rolodex so we we're all we could reach out to each other if we if we needed some help um another example was sort of like moving a little bit toward the middle of my of my time um, when i worked at air mobility command um i got to uh, be a part of uh, writing contracts that supported um, dispatching the executive airlift fleet which supports um, air force one so the president like literally of the united states and then um, sort of like most recently when I was at Cannon Air Force Base, um, being a part of uh, helping write contracts to support the military working dogs we have that literally um, support missions for the NSA um, that to help uh, support members of Congress and the president as well. Um, so, you know, those were all really amazing opportunities. And then just being a flight chief, being a, a squadron deputy, and now working at um, the level that I work at as a procurement analyst, supporting people in the field, seeing how the things they do the, that they have to staff up to me every day, and I'm helping them get it across the finish line, makes sure. me feel really, really connected to all those people. No, absolutely. You know, it, <laughs> I love to tell stories, but I love to hear these stories as well, you know, from our team members, you know, your rewarding moments. Um, you guys really do work some magic because, you know, when you're at certain levels and you just don't know how it all happened, but you have what you need when you need to have it or, you know, all that stuff. So that's just great, great stuff. I mean, all success stories, um, you know, and, and that's, we're, again, we're here to help our audience, you know, connect to that and make their own success story. Um, I got a question from Jim. Um that, you know, we're, we're going to kind of go back just a little bit because Jim's asking this question about business experience. You know, does business experience help toward contracting qualifications? So Jim's interested. He wants to know how can he, you know, so who would like to feel that the business experience towards qualifications? So I can I can tell you um, in very short term, yes, it does. Um, there is opportunity, and it might correct me if I'm wrong, but there is opportunity to move some of your business experience um, into our career field to give you some time, uh, for lack of a better way to say it right now, to give you some time in the career field um, towards your certifications. And there's 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 several ways to, to, that you get certified to, to do what we do, um, and 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 a lot, some of them have a time requirement with them. So in that in that aspect, you may get your experience for business. Um, that comes down to the career field team to kind of pull out your resume and draw out what it was you've done. It may also, and Mike, shake your head north or south if I'm right. <laughs> um, it may also impact your grading when you come in. Uh, we mentioned that an undergraduate, uh, you, you seven, not eleven, but and sometimes your your masters, if you have that, that could also help you out. Um, Lee's mentioned your GPA, um, a higher GPA would sometimes help you. So yeah, if you have some business experience, it'll probably help you a little bit. It's not going to make you a GS-15 um, making 200000 a year if you've worked at um, 
advanced auto for two, two months running a cash register though so just uh, temper that with a little bit of reality as well but um i think that the recruiting team and certainly um when you get closer to to hiring that that career field team that we talk about a lot will be able to help you um to kind of transfer some of those uh, experiences over to the air force no that's great and and doug i got i gotta tell you that i i can really appreciate you just keeping it real for us um you know just the whole idea of let's let's not, I'm going to say, overemphasize what your qualifications will get you. You know, you have to be realistic about it. Um, we all have to start someplace. Uh, and, but when we do that, again, we want to, we do want to give you credit for all that you've done, you know, all the experiences that you've had, but we do have to categorize it correctly into that field. So, so that's all good stuff. Um, I got another question um, from Raul that he wants to know, because I know that, you know, we just went through this pandemic and a lot of us, you know, we're working from home. I'm working from home right now. You can tell by the background. Um, but he's, his question is, is the Air Force Civilian Service working towards some remote work opportunities or is it position to position? So working outside yes. of the office. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a yes. No. Yeah. So, um, and, and look, I'm, I'm I'm keenly aware of the time that, that we uh, constraint that we're under, but real sure. quick on the, on that, um, so there's a balance in there. I mean, clearly behind me is my is my house, um, and right. we're all working from home, um, but we're we're bringing about 50, 60 years of experience um, to this to this panel, um, a copper cap who's just starting out. You may do some teleworking. Um, I would have no problem with that, but you're probably going to be required to come in and sit with somebody who's got the ex requisite experiences to train you in the way you need to go. Um, because it's not fair to have you um, online waiting for somebody to call you and, and kind of tell you what to do. You would, you should be, you should expect that there's going to be some in seat requirement. Whoever hires you um, to come in, and you know, frankly, um, I'm up in the Pentagon um, more more often than than we were during the pandemic. Um, my commute is 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 not the best in the world, but this is what I signed up to do, and, and it, that is to come into the building and support my my geos, my general officers, and, and my uh, my leaders um, in seat sometimes, and that and that may happen. Hopefully, that answers your question. So I, I would just add under there real quick. So you're right. It is position dependent. Uh, what I will say is it, generally there's greater flexibility as, you know, after that three-year time when you're in outplace, most units do have a telework policy in place. You know, how, how liberal it is or conservative it is, is, is unit by unit. The one thing I would say is that as an, you know, you're coming into the career field brand new, you don't want to be at a disadvantage by working exclusively from home because there's something to be right. said, right? I love working from home, but there's something to be said about having that conversation in the moment when I see something. So for instance, you know, bet read between the line items, right? You know, if I saw a, a, a line item structure, I had a funding question because my line of accounting was messed up, you know, for me to just turn around or to ask somebody who's right outside where I'm sitting or across from my desk or near me, you know, it's, it's so easy and I can get the answer quickly there, whereas maybe I'm more hesitant to reach out. And that's one thing the career field team is looking into is to figure out, you know, what's the right approach? What's the right mix to have telework? Uh, it's certainly an op opportunity, but really the primary thing that they want to do is to get you trained up what we call a live round. So at the end of that three years, you're a journeyman, right? You can go out, you can, you can have a warrant or be on the path to getting a warrant. And there's a host of different opportunities that open up with that. Yeah. And guys, you are not going to believe we're like almost completely out of time. Um, but I do want to, I do want to say one thing about, you know, telework and remote. Um, sometimes people use those terms interchangeably, but they're not really interchangeable. Right. Not yeah. as far as the Air Force Civilian Service is concerned. Remote work means that my job is located at the Pentagon, but I physically live in California and I'm never going to the Pentagon to go to work. That's remote. Telework is you are within driving distance to get to work. 
And that's kind of what Doug was saying. You know, he says, hey, you know, I work out of my house, but I spend a lot of time in the office, in the chair. That's telework, okay? So when you're looking for opportunities, just kind of keep that in mind, the difference between a remote position and a telework position, um, because we don't want you to be misled and we certainly don't want you to find out hey, I got to be in the office in the morning and it's 1400 miles away. Um, so, <laughs> so just be aware of that. Um, you know, and yeah, believe it or not, that's it. You know, I mean, that's that's really all the time that we have for today. Um, thank you so much for everyone, you know, for joining us. Uh, I hope that, you know, you get your questions answered. I know there's some in the Q&A box. Um, you'll be happy to know that we can capture those. If you put your questions in the question and answer box, we can capture those. We can get back to you um, after we close this evening. Um, you've, you know, we've had some opportunities, you know, that we shared. They're just incredible. Uh, the AFCS has for students, recent grads. Um, but also, you know, if you do have experience, you don't have to come in you know, in, into a copper cap program or an intern program. You know, we do hire you with years of experience and you can come in. Those opportunities do come up. Um, you know, just as a reminder, you know, any of the resources we mentioned, they're going to be in the chat box. We're going to post a recording of this webinar later on um, when we get it cleaned up and that kind of thing, and it'll be posted on our website. But until then, you know, follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, you know, for just more tips, hot jobs, you know, um, and I look forward to seeing you next month, uh, March 1st. Uh, it's 6 p.m. Central, and uh, hope to see you then. Have a great evening.